All right, folks, for this chapter and in this lecture, <clears throat> we're going to focus on emotion. Um, so we're going to be looking at how communication influences our emotion, how in turn emotion influences our communication, and how it's, it's through communication that emotion is both recognized and really how it emerges. Um, so we'll kind of make this connection by getting at the definition of emotion in play. Um, and this is out of your textbook. And it's basically emotions are your body's multidimensional response to any event that enhances or inhibits your goals. So you can look at this basically, there's a few key terms. Um, it's a multidimensional response, meaning it's not just one kind of way of looking at it. There's no one way of really understanding it. Um, it's a really complex thing that, re that happens in your body. It's how your body responds. And this is when something, when you're trying to accomplish something, whether that's in communication or in a relationship or you are trying to get a task done or something like that. Um, if you're trying to write a paper and you're going, you, you know, you're, it's going really well, you're doing really good, you're going to feel good about that. It's going to have this emotion of maybe happiness, joy. Whereas if you keep having writer's block or issues with that, you that, that response, um, your body might respond negatively, maybe upset or frustrated uh, because it's inhibiting your goals. So again, it's when you're trying to accomplish something, and we often think of tasks, but goals are more than just tasks like writing a paper. I mean, this is trying to have a productive conversation in a relationship. This is trying to make somebody laugh. This is trying to make somebody happy. And basically, if we get to our goal or if we don't, it's going to determine how our body responds and what emotion takes place. So we can understand emotions by basically three big categories. It's kind of easier to just categorize everything. So if you get any kind of questions about what are the categories of emotions, these are the big overarching categories. There are joyful and affectionate ones. These are kind of the happy ones, the ones that we enjoy the most. This is when you're with your significant other and you feel all bubbly inside. Or this is when you just got a big award at a sports banquet or anything like that. All the positive ones are really joyful and affectionate category. Hostile is basically anger. This is when we get upset, frustrated, uh, fight, or, fight or flight kind of stuff. Um, these, these, are, these are kind of when you think of somebody like anger um, falls under this category. And then there's sad and anxious. This, this is when we're upset or we're not feeling good. We're not necessarily angry where we want to get, you know, really hostile and upset and mad. Um, but it's more about we're sad and we're kind of down and out. So these are the three main categories. And we'll break them down a little bit further. Um, any kind of joyful, affectionate emotion, these include things like happiness, love, passion, liking. Um, these are, oops, these are all, again, the good ones, all right? So this is when we feel really happy about something, or we feel a certain passion about something, or we really, really like somebody or someone. Um, these are all of the good ones. Any real good emotion that you could think of is going to fall under this category. Anything that has kind of a positive connotation to it is going to fall under this category. The next is hostile. Um, and there's a variety of these, and they each are a little bit different. And I'm not going to go into too much depth with each of these. You can read these in your textbook to get all the details. But basically, these are the ones where we're angry or we have contempt or disgust or jealousy um, or envy. Again, sorry for jumping ahead of time. But anger, this is when somebody's wronged us or something has wronged us. We get mad about that. Contempt is associated with a feeling of superiority over another. If somebody does something wrong to us or we feel like we have control or power over them, um, we'll hold contempt. Disgust is when we literally feel revolt, we're like revulsion. We feel sick. We feel gross. We feel just disgusted um, with something. Jealousy, this is when you see a relationship being threatened by another. Um, and envy, this is when we want to be like somebody. We want to be like somebody. We want, we want to have what they have. Um, so these are all considered hostile emotions. And then the last category is sad, anxious emotions. This is sadness and depression. This is the loss of another. This is the termination of a relationship and those types of things happen. Grief is considered a sad and anxious emotion. Uh, this is if we're dealing with some kind of loss, whether that's death or we lose our job, we lose a loved one, we're going through some kind of illness that's life-changing. Um, and then there's fear. This is anytime we're feeling fearful of something. If you have to give a public presentation, you feel that anxiety with it, that's fear. If you're getting into a situation you've never been in before, that's fear when you're feeling anxious 
about that. Or if you're walking through the haunted house and that stuff freaks you out, um, that, that feeling of fear, um, that's associated with a sad or an anxious emotion. Um, read in your textbook, sadness and depression, these are two different things. Um, and I want you to focus in your textbook on what it is that they point out and what they describe the difference between those two as. Um, and then there's also social anxiety. This is basically you have the fear of the impressions that you make. You 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 get really nervous when you're in social settings because you're you're upset or you could because you're kind of nervous um, about the impression that other people are going to give or are going to gain of you. You're nervous about how you're going to come across to others, and it 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 basically inhibits your ability to interact in social settings in a lot of ways. But that anxiety associated with that, that social anxiety, that's, again, considered a sad, anxious emotion. So, again, the biggest thing, the biggest takeaway from this is know these three big categories and be able to identify the different emotions that your textbook lays out and put them in the correct categories um, and be able to identify where they kind of belong and how they're understood. So let's break down the nature of emotion just a little bit. They're multidimensional, right? Emotions are not just this one thing uh, that we can just understand in one way. There's a lot of different facets when it comes to emotions. There's physiological components. Emotions literally affect how we feel. They physically affect how our body feels. They affect how, you know, whether we're trembling, sweating, short of breath, heart beating, um, down and out, kind of lazy, don't have a whole lot of energy, have a lot of energy because you got really excited. They literally affect how we feel physically. There's cognitive components, though. They also affect how we feel or they affect how we think. They affect how we process things. They affect how we come to conclusions and arrive at conclusions. So they affect us physically. They connect our. They, they affect our brain, and then they also affect how we how we do things behaviorally. They affect how we engage in certain behaviors. They affect how we take action upon something, how we respond, and what we decide to do based on those things. And then there's also social and cultural components. There are any any time we're talking about communication, there will always be a social and cultural component. And basically, it's how society views a situation, how that influences our actions. So in certain cultures. It's completely okay for somebody to kiss a stranger on the cheek when they're greeting somebody. In other cultures, that's completely not acceptable. And because of that, that same action is going to have different views and different perspectives gained from it because it's influenced by the social and cultural context in which that action is taking place. So emotions, they affect how we feel, they affect how we think, they affect how we behave and the actions that we take, and they also are played out differently and interpreted and understood differently depending on the culture in which it's situated in. They vary in their valence and intensity. And what valence refers to is how positive or negative it is. So if you want to think of valence, you can really look at it on a spectrum where you have positive on one end and negative on the other end. And emotions constantly go back and forth on this spectrum. And the emotion, uh, the intensity refers to how strong it is. Some emotions are kind of weak, right? Like you can be... You can be scared, like you can be scared about something, you can be fearful about something, but it's not going to completely, you know, make it to the point where you can't function. You're not going to be debilitated by it. Whereas other times you can be so fearful, so scared that you literally can't move. Like when you get into positions where you're in shock, right? So sometimes you can be just kind of scared of something or you can be really, really scared of something. You can be kind of sad about something. You can be extremely sad about something. So just always understand that emotions, they exist on a spectrum of both positive and negative. Some are super positive. Some are super negative. Some lie in the middle. And then also some emotions can be really, really strong and overwhelming. Others can be kind of weak and manageable. But if you just want to look at these as spectrums, that's kind of the best way to understand it. Um, there's also primary and secondary emotions, right? So basically, some of these are distinct emotional experiences. Fear, joy, surprise. These are primary emotions. We know what these are. We know exactly what they are and what they feel like and how they make us think. These are similar across cultures, and they're closely related to biological structure. Whereas secondary emotions like jealousy, contempt, and remorse, these are basically composed of combinations of primary emotions. If you think of jealousy, that's kind of like a combination of, of fear, also a little bit of a combination of like jealous, or not, not sorry, jealousy would be kind of like a combination of fear, maybe a little bit of sadness in there. Um, there there's a bit of a... Um, Basically, these are these are emotions that are a bunch of other emotions comprised of 
primary emotions. So again, be able to recognize based on your textbook what are considered primary emotions and what are considered secondary emotions. A lot of just categorization when it comes to emotions. Um, sometimes emotions are meta emotions and what these are are emotions about our emotions. So whenever you see meta in front of something, that's what it means. If we're talking about meta communication, that's communication about communication. In this case, meta, meta, meta emotions, these are emotions about emotions. So this is like if you're jealous and you feel embarrassed about it, or if you're, you know, or those that are fear junkies, right? There's a lot of us out there that love, you know, being scared and getting that kind of adrenaline rush. We, it's, it's the adrenaline that follows the fear, right? So we get excited for our fear. And then you can feel surprised that someone else wasn't angry. If somebody gets upset or whatever, you, you know, if somebody wasn't mad about something that they said about you or if your significant other, you know, heard somebody saying something bad about you but you weren't, uh, they didn't get upset about it, that can make you feel surprised that they didn't get angry. So these these are just three examples. These aren't like cut – this isn't like this is how this works. This isn't the only three um, types. It's just – few different examples to show you how you can have emotions about other emotions. So what influences us? We talked about this a little bit. Culture affects our emotions. Research shows that there's geographic differences. Depending on where you are geographically, that will affect how emotional expressive you are. One example is wherever there's warmer weather, people are more expressive. Walk around Michigan in the middle of winter. See how many people are walking up and down the street, smiling and waving and hugging one another compared to in the summertime when it's nice out, right? More eye contact, more waving, more just kind of natural expression of emotions when the weather's nicer. Whereas when it's cold, people kind of bottle up a little bit because they're just not in as happy of a mood. Basically, it's cold out. It's not You're not going to express as many emotions. Um, there's cold cultural differences in emotional behavior too. This is Dr. Mark Orby, a professor of Western Michigan um, who created this theory. And then it's basically cold cultural theory gets at how different cultures, people from different cultures interact with one another. And basically, if you're from different cultures, you're going to have different emotional behaviors. And when you're speaking with people from different cultures, they are going to have different emotional behaviors, responses, interpretations, so on and so forth. So culture is always playing a role in communication, and especially in emotion. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Expression is affected by display rules. Um, <clears throat> there are different rules and different basically factors to consider when emotions are being expressed. There's intensification. This is when you are exaggerating an emotion. There's de-intensification. This is when you're downplaying an emotion. So with both of these, it's like you could be feeling an emotion a certain way, but you might take it a little bit further than necessary. You might be kind of being a little bit more dramatic than necessary. Or when you're really upset and heartbroken over something, this is when you're like, no, it's okay. I don't mind. Um, it's not that big of a deal. There's simulations. This is when you're faking emotions, basically. If you're in a conversation with somebody, maybe you don't really feel sad that their cat or their dog ran away, but you want to express to them that you're caring and you're empathetic, so you'll pretend that you're sad that their cat or their dog ran away. Inhibition is when you just completely hold an emotion in your stone face. This is when you're just monotone. You're not showing any kind of emotion. And masking is where you cover one emotion with another. This is where if you're really, really sad and you want to cry, but you laugh instead. This is when people, This is that's probably one of the easiest ones I can think of. When people are really, really upset, instead of being, they can't just inhibit it. They can't just hold it in. They have to mask it with another one. They have to somehow express themselves, but they don't want you to see what it is or you don't want others to see exactly how you're feeling emotionally. So you cover it up with a different emotion. So understand these display rules and the way that they work. And if you, I'm sure as you read through these and start thinking about your own interpersonal interactions with people and in your life, you can think of different examples where this has taken place. Uh, one of the last things I want to focus on is emotional labor. And this is a really fun theory and a really fun um, idea that was developed by Hochschild in 1983. And basically what this gets at is when we work, we, oftentimes in society when we're out in public, we're on what's considered like a front stage. And we are sometimes forced to enact specific emotions and displays. So if any of you have ever worked in the service industry where you're like a bartender or a server or a hostess or something like that, and you get a really pissed off and angry customer, well, you can't just yell back at them and call them names and be upset with them. You still have to be polite. You still have to be courteous. You still have to be their servant in a certain way. 
This is what emotional labor gets at. It's the labor associated with performing specific emotions and displays that we are not feeling. And it's really draining. Any of you that have worked in the service industry, I know you know what I'm talking about. At the end of your shift, you're completely burned out. It's not because of the running around that you've done. It's not because of bringing food to people or taking their checks up. It's because you've had to put on an emotional performance for them. That's what emotional labor gets at. So what are some influences on emotional experiences and expressions? Technology affects emotion. And with technology, thinking about when we're texting um, or we're on Facebook or we're on Twitter, um, there's a lack of nonverbal signals and it's an opportunity for sharing emotion. Um, we, can, we can use emojis and stuff like that. We have to express our emotions more clearly in the content that we use because in technology, we don't have the nonverbal signals to work with. And emotion towards technology itself represents, represents an emotion. The way that we feel about the use of technology um, and, and do we want to use it or not, these are all parts of how technology affects our emotions. Emotional contagion. This affects experience and expressions. And basically what emotional, emotional contagion gets at is how contagious emotions are. Um, people tend to mimic the experiences and expressions of others. So that's why, you know, it's always a good it's always a good piece of advice when you're going into work or going into class. Go in there with a positive attitude, even if you have to fake it a little bit, because that might become contagious. Other people might pick up on that. Other people might be cheerful and giddy because you showed up cheerful and giddy. They might not have been before, but now they are because you are. And I'm sure this has happened to some of you where out of nowhere somebody shows up to something and they're happy um, or they show up and they're sad. And all of a sudden you're like, why am I happy now? Or, oh, now I'm sad. I wasn't before. What happened? Well, that's because we often pick up on the emotions of other people. And in social settings, we like to mimic those. We like to express those things the same way that other people are. And emotional contagion, this happens both in face-to-face -face and online settings. So just keep that in mind. Although we typically think of this in face to face context. This can happen online and in technological settings as well. Sex and gender. Sex is always going to play a role. Sex and gender will always play a role in our communication and, and, and as well this takes place with emotions too. Um, the gender, sex and gender roles influence both the experience and expression of emotions. So our biological sex plays a huge role and then the gender roles that have been prescribed to us and we've been socialized into, these play a big role in how we think and respond to emotions, how we think we are allowed to express ourselves and how we should be interpreting the expressions of others. And some research shows sex differences in jealousy. Um, men are more likely to experience sexual jealousy. Women are more likely to experience emotional jealousy. Um, just keep this kind of stuff in mind. There are biological differences in us, but there are also socially constructed gender roles that influence this kind of stuff as well. Finally, there's three personality dimensions, dimensions that affect how we experience emotion. There's agreeability. Some of us are more cooperative than others. others. Some of us are more willing to agree with people. Others are not so much willing to agree with people. Extroversion. How much of an extrovert or an introvert are you? That's going to determine how much you actually express it or how much you keep it in half the time. And neuroticism. This is if people are, are you a pessimist or are you an optimist? Do you see the world more optimistically? Do you think things are good and they're going to work out? Or do you think, see things more pessimistically in terms of there's going to be negative outcomes associated with things. Your emotional intelligence, this refers to the ability to perceive and express emotion and to use emotion to facilitate thought and emotional growth. This basically is how well you are good at gauging other people's emotion, how well you are at gauging your own emotion, and how much you realize you can use emotions to your benefit within any type of interpersonal conversation. So if you think of like, if any of you are into motivational speaking and that kind of stuff fires you up, it's because they're aware of how they can work their audience's emotions. If you think of a really good car salesman that's able to talk people into buying things, it because it's because car salespeople are able to play off of others' emotions, figure out what they like, and then get them fired up and get them feeling happy and make them feel positively about certain things when they're in that sales transaction. So emotional intelligence 
intelligence is all about how well you can perceive emotions, how well you can express emotions, and how you can use emotions to facilitate thought and emotions through other people. It sounds, it, it sounds kind of dirty. It sounds kind of like it's manipulative, and in some cases it is. In other cases, being emotionally intelligent just makes you more of a competent communicator when interacting with people in interpersonal contexts. There's a section about how to improve your emotional skills. Be sure to read that. We didn't go over any of that in this lecture. I highlighted the things that I thought were most important from the chapter. But again, and as always, be sure to be reading your chapters each week because there's a lot more details in the book.